Welcome to the weekly Times of Industry show. I'm here with Simon Black, the Sovereign Man, .com, an entrepreneur, an investor, just a great guy. I've, I've spent the, like the last 30 minutes just chatting with him because it's, it's so fun. And we are going to have an impactful interview. You know, we, we have on these interviews on our show, we have investors, we have entrepreneurs. Um, we have, we have uh, from all walks of life, but Simon is something unique. I, I First of all, Simon, how are you? I'm great. I've enjoyed the conversation so far. It's been good. Uh, it's been good chatting. Look, we're having this conversation on March 6th, 2017. And, and you know, uh, some people are going to listen to this before March 15th. Some people are going to listen to this after March 15th. And the reason I bring this up is because of the debt ceiling. And we'll get into that later. I also want to get into Europe um, and, and what's going on over there uh, with the uh, French election coming up. It looks like the, uh, the populist vote is getting some traction action and also you know i, I want to make sure that people understand your story because a lot of people can relate to it and i want you to to uh, go into depth about you know the options that people have because you're 38 you're very accomplished you started two banks uh you, you run a newsletter company you have some uh, some farm and agricultural businesses i mean you've done you've done a lot and i want to ask you first what the sovereign man represents to you what what is this term how did you coin it and and what core values does it uh you know bring out in your personality well uh you know it's kind of interesting because uh you know sovereign in many respects is almost a, a a dirty word now among some people it's unfortunate i mean there's a there's a, a, a some some group called the sovereign citizen movement and some of these guys have gone out and started uh i mean just just you know, I'm just acting like a bunch of boneheads. And, and so it, it, in many respects, it's almost a dirty word now. But to me, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, but I mean, to me, to me, it's really just about personal freedom. It's about being an independent human being. If you look at, at I mean, at so many, I mean, every every sovereign nation around the world, uh, what that really means is these, these, are, these are independent countries that exercise their own autonomy. And so for me as an individual, it, it, the same thing applies is that, you know, I'm an independent human being. Uh, I'm capable of making my own decisions. And, and for me, you know, I don't need, you know, some authority to tell me what I can and cannot put in my own body or how I'm allowed to live my life or what I'm allowed to invest in or what activities I'm allowed. To me, it's just about personal freedom. It's about the ability to be able to make your own decisions uh, and succeed or fail in life based on your own actions and not, uh, you know, not because you're, you're, you're you know, constantly being uh, told what to do and overregulated and these sorts of things. That, that's that's what it's really all about for me. It's a sense of personal uh, independence. And, and I've, uh, you know, basically Basically, that's that's the way I live my life. Sure, uh, you know when somebody gets that passionate about uh, any topic, it's 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 usually because of pain that was accumulated at an earlier point. I know for me, um, you know, my father went bankrupt twice when I was thirteen to eighteen, so that made me very cautious in in pursuing business. And very cautious in life, very, uh, you know, it made me read so much about investing and finances because of the pain I felt as a teenager. Um, does this passion for being sovereign and protective about your identity and your wealth and, and, and your body and, you know, everything that surrounds you, does it come from, from a story that you can share with us? Well, I used to be in the military. Um, I went to uh, I went to West Point. I went to the military academy, and I was uh, commissioned uh, as an officer and, and spent several years in the army. And um, during the uh, you know during the run up to the to the Gulf War, uh, the invasion of Iraq, basically, um, uh, I was an intelligence officer. And we were all sitting around in the desert prior to, you know, my unit was there. We're all sitting in, in Kuwait prior to the invasion of Iraq. And, and the U.S. government, George W. Bush, oh, this was uh, 2002. This was 2002. Uh, we were there you know, waiting. There. The invasion kicked off in March 2003. Uh, we were all there in, in um, you know, in, in 2002, uh, still late 2002, waiting around for these guys to, you know, to give the order and make the decision. The whole time they're talking about WMDs. I mean, you guys all remember that WMDs always got nukes. We know he's got these nukes and we're all sitting around 
you know, as, as uh, you know, intelligence officers on a strategic level where, you know, our units getting calls from the White House and, and you know, CIA and all the all these three letter agencies. And I'm, you know, we're sitting here trying to figure out what, you know, what nukes is this guy talking about? Um, and, uh, you know, of course, lo and behold, there, there weren't any nukes, but they kept talking about, you know, nukes. We know he's got these nukes and they went to war based on this false premise. And that was a that was a disturbing time period for me. And I remember thinking if they're lying about this, then what else are they lying about? And turned out to be, oh, I was super pro. I mean, you know, I don't like to use the word patriotic because to me, um, you know, to me, a real patriot is somebody that understands that that has the courage to understand what's happening. Uh, and, and, you know, but I, I would say, you know, I was I was probably blind, uh, like a lot of folks. And, and never really questioned anything. Yeah, I never, I never questioned anything. I never, I never bothered to, to scratch the surface of what I was told. I just said, oh, well, that's what the government said. So it must be, you know, it must be legit. And then I, you know, only come to find later that everything that sort of I had grown up believing about a lot of those ideals were complete bullshit. Um, and I, and I say that again, as, as having been in that position where I, some very dark days knowing that, you know, right before the invasion kicked off, I remember some of the most, some of the, some of the darkest days of my life, knowing that, you know, uh, I mean, tens of thousands of people, you know, everybody's always, you know, we're all going into combat. Who, how many people are going to die? How many people are putting, being put in harm's way based on a bunch of lies, you know, and, and, you know, we knew it was a lie. And I just remember thinking, my God, and again, what if they're lying about this, then what else are they lying about? And before I had never questioned anything like that. And it was only at that point, I thought, you know, it is like my entire reality just shattered. And it took me down this road where I said, okay, well, let's see what else are these guys lying about? What else have I been told my whole life? And that led me to all kinds of other things about the debt. You know, you mentioned the debt ceiling, but led me to the debt. It led me to just the entire you know, authoritative, you know, nature of government where, you know, we start, you start looking at the constitution and you start seeing the way that, uh, you know, then the freedoms that are guaranteed by the constitution, and then you start looking at the way, uh, the ways that, that, that they actually govern, you go, wait a minute, this, this is a total mismatch here. This isn't right. Um, you know, and that, that sort of led me to this, uh, you know, this long, you know, growth and, 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 and development period uh, to where I am today. Uh, I've been this way for quite some time, but, but essentially the, you know, the end result is to say, hey, forget it. You know, these, these guys don't have power over me. They don't have, you know, they, they, they don't control my life. Uh, I control my life. I make my own decisions. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's essentially the way that, uh, that I set my life up now and, and the way that I live my life today. Sure, and, and you know, I want to I want to switch gears right here to to more current events. But before that, yeah. I just want to ask you, when you were there, two thousand three, in the invasion, what did you think was the real reason for the invasion? After you found out that obviously, um, you know, the government lies, but the you know, what was the talk of the day during your your uh, during the intelligence community inside there, were you all seeing that this is not the case? What did what did what was the vibe? Um, you know, it was it was it was interesting to me because um, there were still a lot of believers. There were still I even mean, my unit. It, it was a it was there were still a lot of people that were convinced that oh, there's weapons. They're out there. You know, we know they're out there somewhere. You know, and I thought no, we don't. There's no data that suggests that they're anywhere. Uh, we don't have, you know, I'm, I'm a very data driven, very data oriented person. And so, you know, if, if uh, you know, and the, I'm not going to, I'm not going to reach a conclusion, in the absence of data. And the reality is even in terms of what's the real reason behind it. Um, I don't have any data about that either. I, I don't, I don't have the, I don't have the story. I don't know the, I don't know the, the real information. I actually ended up years later, I actually met George W. Bush, uh, actually struck me as a, as an incredibly, jovial guy that, you know, seemed to be legitimately, you know, and this is the thing I think I'm, I'm not one to assume that politicians, you know, are evil people with an agenda to, you know, to destroy the world or any of these things. I, I think legitimately there's a, there's a large part that they probably do what they think is right at the time, even when they get it massively wrong. And, you know, that it may be entirely possible that Bush might have legitimately felt that there were weapons uh, there. Maybe somebody told him there were weapons, or maybe he was just interested in, you know, oil profits or securing, you know, oil supply for the United States. But I don't have any data, so I, I can't, you know, I can't, I, I can't reach a conclusion on that. Sure, that's very interesting. Um, look, the debt ceiling, uh, Obama and Bonner, uh, a couple of years ago, signed this debt holiday, and now, you know, it's coming to fruition. Obviously, not on his watch which uh, he, uh, 
realized when he when he signed it as long as uh, he doesn't have to take care of it and somebody else will. Now that somebody happened to be Donald Trump. Many wild cards here. Washington pol polarized more than ever. How, how do you see this play out? And do you think it's a crisis or is this, you know, another uh, type of a challenge that's fixable with just raising the debt ceiling? Do you think this will have ramifications? Oh, yeah, I think it'll have ramifications. Um, you know, look, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it is just about mathematically impossible to, uh, you know, for the United States to pay off the debt. Um, the debt level is, uh, you know, already uh, well in excess of 100% of GDP. Um, they add more to the debt every year uh, uh, than, than the, you know, the sort of the percentage of debt growth far exceeds GDP growth. So that number gets worse and worse every year. And now they were able to get away with it for a long time because, um, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the interest rates were at record lows and now interest rates are starting to increase again. We're seeing that in the, in the bond yields and so forth. So it means that the federal government is uh, going to have to pay, you know, not only is the debt getting bigger, but the interest rate is getting larger, which means they're going to have to pay more and more and more of, uh, you know, of their, uh, annual budget, a larger percentage of that is going to go to just paying interest on the debt. So, um, you know, this is th this is not a political problem. This is an arithmetic problem, uh, and the you know the numbers just don't add up. So whether it happens this time around or next time around, um, you know, th this is going to be a, this is going to be a long this is a long term issue with long term ramifications. Um, I don't you know I don't think it's realistic to presume there's going to be some acute. Uh, you know, event in the next, uh, certainly not in the next nine days, uh, 10 days, that's, that's going to cause some, some, some major uh, financial crisis. Um, you know, we'll probably see, you know, the, the, the markets might, you know, punish the dollar and start selling off, uh, you know, some of the currency. We might see some weakness from that if they, if they show that they can't get their act together. Uh, would, yeah, but, uh, you know, for the most part, like this, this problem is just getting bigger and bigger. Every year it gets bigger. Uh, I mean, if you look at the numbers, again, I'm a data-driven person. My whole organization is extremely data-driven. If you look at the numbers uh, of the United States federal budget, it's appalling. Uh, you know, the vast majority of everything that they, uh, all the tax revenue they take in uh, goes to mandatory entitlement programs that don't even receive a vote uh, from Congress. So it's sort of like, you know, somebody buys a house uh, or a car, you know, your mortgage payment just gets sucked out of your account. Your car payment just gets sucked right out of your account every month. Um, you, you don't have to write a check for it. Even it just it just gets automatically taken out. There's not even a decision on your part as, gee, what are, do I pay the mortgage or not? It's all automatically taken out of your bank account every month. All right. So that's how Social Security and Medicare and and even interest on the debt, all these things, it's just sucked right out of the of the national bank account, um, you know, every year. Congress doesn't even vote on it. And so there's literally table scraps left over um, the, for, for Congress to actually vote on it to the point where they could they could honestly get rid of they could they could eliminate entire departments of government. They could get rid of the National Park Service. They could shut down the Labor Department and the Commerce Department. They could shut down the Internal Revenue Service, all these things. They could just literally get rid of entire departments of government and they still wouldn't have enough money just to pay for all these mandatory entitlement programs and interest on the debt and a little bit of national defense. So, I mean, that's, that's a hopeless situation. And the only way out of that is, I mean, it's not the first time there's been a government that's bankrupt. So the only way out of that is at some point you have to default. Uh, and, and you, you know, you, they're either going to default on uh, their creditors, the, the people that essentially own uh, bonds, U.S. government bonds, they're going to have to default on those guys, or uh, they're going to have to default on the promises that they've made to taxpayers, people for their entire lives. Particularly if you're if you're if you're listening to this and you're a younger person, you can pretty much forget about Social Security. I mean, if you're under forty, uh, forget it. Um, I mean, the, every single year, the trustees of the Social Security uh, of the Social Security trust funds uh, issue a, a report. This is available online. This is publicly available information to anybody that wants to look at it. It's on it's on the Social Security Administration's website. Yeah, and the and the report. The report basically says, you know, hey, we, we don't have enough money. We are running out of money quickly. The med and some of the Medicare trust funds have already run out of money. You know, so this isn't some wild and crazy conspiracy theory. This is a this is an annual report that's signed by the Treasury Secretary of the United States of America. This isn't some, you know, this isn't some some, you know, nutcase, you know, whack job.
the secretary is telling us this. The Secretary of Health and Human Services is telling us So this. this the, the likelihood um, that they're going to be able to keep these promises is about 0%. Um, they're going to have to default. And so, again, it's either defaulting on their creditors uh, or they default on, on, their, on the taxpayers, on the citizens, basically. And if you look at the way that the financial system is structured, so the taxpayers, if, just, if you look at the options between defaulting on the promises they've made to their citizens versus defaulting on their, uh, on their creditors, just if you look at the way the financial system is structured, uh, the dollar being the, the dominant reserve currency in the world and, you know, U.S. treasuries being held by central banks and foreign governments all over the world and, and these sorts of things that the, 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 the least bad option, given the way the financial system is, is very dollar centric and structured around the U.S. dollar, the least bad option is for them to default on their on their citizens, uh, on the promises that they've made to people. And that means things like Social Security. And Medicare and 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 you know all all the other promises that you know the governments make to people. Sure. Um, well, obviously there's another option of just uh, inflating it away. Um, uh, you know, there's a- oh, well, that's 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 one of the promises as well. You're right. That's one of the other promises. One of the promises that governments uh, make and and central banks is say, hey, we promise to maintain a stable currency. Well, they're going to default on that promise as well. You know, so you can forget about. You know, not only can you forget about, you know, Social Security and Medicare, you can forget about having stable currency. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a, again, that's a long term. Uh, that's a long term problem. Sure. I, Simon, I want to move over to Europe. You know, the only economy larger than the United States is the European Union. And they're going to have a French election on May 7th. And I've coined the, this term, uh, well, I probably haven't coined it, but I've used this term called peak globalization. Because if the populist candidate, the, the essentially Trump's counterpart, um, is starting to gain on polls, if she wins, they will consider leaving the euro for good. And, you know, regardless, she's in favor of nationalism and closing down borders tighter. Obviously, I've been to France last year. It's, it's, it's uh, well, the capital doesn't look like a European uh, capital anymore. It's, it's full of uh, refugees from, from the Middle East fleeing uh, the deadly wars there. Obviously, you can't blame them. And the EU is larger than the US economy. How big of a threat is this, you know, the second largest country in the EU uh, exiting the, uh, the, the joint market? Oh, I think uh, I, I, I say this, I'm going to preface my statement by saying I'm actually an optimist. Uh, you know, I see certainly a lot of problems, uh, but, you know, as, you know, as an entrepreneur, I see with every problem is just an opportunity in disguise. Um, having said that, I think Europe is a complete basket case. Um, you know, Europe has so many simultaneous uh, crises. You know, Europe has its own internal uh, political crises. You know, they can't manage to even keep themselves together. Uh, Europe has, um, you know, refugee crisis and immigration crisis. They have, uh, you know, they have a, in many parts a rape crisis. Uh, it is the monetary uh, crisis. They have a youth unemployment crisis. You know, you still see, you know, years after the uh, after the uh, uh, you know the financial crisis 2008, you still see you know, these appalling youth unemployment rates. Um, and so, of course, you know, people are sick and tired of it. They're tired of the same staid politicians that keep promising the same nonsense and never really delivering. So, yeah, they, I mean, you see this around the world. They're starting to uh, shift towards these more uh, radical candidates that are, you know, promising things that are bold and new and different because they're, in many cases, kind of feeling desperate. And, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, the euro has been, uh, you know, the euro, even travelers and tourists uh, to a degree. But I mean, talk about a failed, uh, I mean, a completely failed uh, concept. Um, they knew it was a failure going into it. And, and uh, you know, there's a great story about the early framers of the euro when they, you know, they got everything done. They signed all the papers and they kind of went to the younger generation of politicians and they said, well, it's up to you to keep it together. You know, it, it's <laughs> they, they knew it was a total disaster um, even back then. And now we're just, you know, we're seeing the effects of that in Greece and in Italy and so forth. I mean, you know, Greece has its perennial crisis that never ends you know, with its debt. Uh, when one of the other obviously major crises in Europe, the, the debt crisis across so many uh, of these countries. And in Italy now, we see a banking crisis uh, with so many of the major banks in Italy that are poorly capitalized and in need of uh, public bailouts. 
Uh, and so, you know, obviously the solution for all these guys, it goes back to the comment that you made uh, that we were talking about, talking about, you know, defaulting, um, you know, that means defaulting on, on the, the stability in your currency. And you go back to what governments always want to do, which is just basically print more money. Well, they don't have the luxury of doing that under the euro. So, you know, Greek, uh, Italian, and even French politicians, of course, it's to their benefit to, uh, you know, to be able to have control over their own money supply. The French had a long history of this. Uh, there's a great book I'd recommend uh, to any of your listeners. Uh, it's a book by a guy named Andrew Dixon White called French, uh, no, sorry, Fiat Money Inflation in France. And it's about the history of of uh, monetary inflation uh, in France after the French Revolution in the late 17 uh, in the 1790s, uh, and it was absolutely phenomenal. They came up with this great idea. They said, "Oh, let's print a bunch of paper money," and people said, "Great!" And they started printing money, and asset prices went up, and land prices went up, and so people felt wealthier. And then retail prices they experienced some epic hyperinflation uh, as a result of this. And so this is something that uh, I mean we've seen this over and over and over again throughout history and and uh you know that this uh, it would be foolish to say that this time uh, is going to be any different but i think that's a solution that a number of european countries are certainly looking at the growth and the in the movement to exit the euro is is becoming stronger and stronger uh all across europe so i mean that's I, it certainly feels inevitable um okay i i went on an interview about a week ago and um, you know, I discussed the fact that I'm getting another passport and I think it's a wise thing to not only diversify yourself between asset classes, uh, between, you know, cash, stocks, uh, chaos hatches like gold, Bitcoin, speculations like uh, mining stocks, etc. But it's also good to diversify politically, own offshore accounts, uh, other passports, real estate, offshore, now where you're living. There, there's many options. Um, and I wanted to, to ask the sovereign man himself, what are some of the simplest ways to diversify your, yourself as an identity and your assets outside of your own country? So, you know, if, if something happens where you live, you don't have everything dry up on you. Uh, look, I, you know, second passport is, is kind of like an insurance policy. It's something that's really great to have. Uh, you might never need to use it, but if you ever do, then you're going to be really glad that you've got one. Um, it's also something that can provide a lot of really um, uh, interesting and unique benefits uh, with a second passport. It means that you have at least one country, if not multiple countries, uh, as in the case in, if you get a European Union passport, uh, that you know where you're welcome to live and work and, and do business and invest and, and, and bring your family and so forth. So it's about having more options. And if we go back to you know sort of the first question that you asked me about, you know, uh, being a, a sovereign, you know, being a sovereign man, being a free person, what that really means, you know, freedom is really all about having uh, having the, having choice, having options, uh, and and the ability to actually choose from those options. The d deliberately being able to choose from the options. Having more options just means more freedom. And so for me, I have, uh, you know, I have multiple passports and it means that I'm able to go around the world. I can travel to more places. I can, you know, I can live in more places and, you know, I'm not worse off for that. There's no downside to say, gee, uh, how terrible is it that I'm, you know, that I'm able to go and, and, you know, live in this, in this other place. that's beautiful. I mean, uh, there's, there's no downside there that I'm able to travel to more places visa free as a result of, of having multiple passports. And that I'm, you know, I'm welcome, uh, you know, in multiple homes as a result of this. There's no downside there. Uh, but of course, you know, if the, 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 of course, the upside, one of the major benefits uh, is in case, yeah, sure, something you ever felt like you just needed to get out uh, and it was time to go, you have a place to go. Uh, you don't have to wonder about it. Uh, you, you know, you, you've, you, you're you welcome with open arms in those places. So, so it's something that definitely makes sense. Obtaining one is, uh, you know, it's a question of, uh, you know, time. Uh, or luck, uh, primarily. If you're lucky enough, you know, might, you might be part of the of the lucky bloodline club. If you have, you know, ancestors from certain countries, Poland, Ireland, Italy, etc. You know, there there are a number of places where, you know, if you have a grandfather from Ireland, then yeah, you can go through a process at a at, at your you know at your local embassy, uh, you know, your local Irish embassy, and go fill out some paperwork and and end up becoming. A citizen of Ireland or Italy or Poland or you know Spain or there's so many different options you know there's quite popular actually with European countries um, you know we have we've we've take, put some of our uh, our uh, uh, premium subscribers into you know places even like Lithuania etc et I mean 
in places you might not even have ever heard of that have this sort of ancestry type citizenship. There are other places that you can actually go and, and uh, quite easily and, and quickly obtain legal residency uh, in a place overseas. Uh, Panama is an example. It's incredibly easy for people from most nationalities to very quickly and easily obtain Panamanian residency. Um, you don't actually have to spend any time there. You don't really have to live there. But after a certain number of, of years, um, then, you know, according to what you know the law says, you're entitled to apply for uh, citizenship. So it's just a way for, you know, just about anybody to be able to obtain, uh, uh, you know, ultimately another nationality in a second passport or third, fourth, fifth passport. And it's this, by the way, uh, depends on which country you're from, if from the United States or Canada or a number of other countries, it's completely legal to have multiple passports. There are some countries uh, like Germany, for example, that have restrictions on on uh, on having uh, multiple nationalities, uh, but um, yeah, but a lot of countries do. Uh, that, that are it's perfectly uh, normal and, and legal to do that, and it's it's just a good idea. Sure. Um, look, I want to finish this uh, uh, this interview with a question that I ask all of our guests here from in 2017. I am going to rank. I want you to rank the following investments for 2017 on a super bullish or bullish or moderate or bearish or don't touch uh, kind of a, a letter. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I left my crystal ball in my other suit, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a go. Okay. Well, perfect. Let's let's start with cash. Um, you know, uh, upside and downside. Cash is great because you eliminate the counterparty risk in the financial system. Uh, if you are a bank depositor, then any risks that your bank has taken on become your risks, and you can eliminate those risks simply by holding cash and ensuring there's no middleman between you and your savings. That's the upside. The downside is uh, if you know in a heavily inflationary period, your cash is going to lose value. Of course, so will your bank deposit. Uh, so I like cash. I encourage people to own cash, but just don't go overboard with it. I wouldn't put your entire life savings in physical cash. Sure. Uh, how about bonds? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I own a bank. I kind of have, um, but my bonds that I own are extremely short term. I own stated bonds uh, only because, you know, when you're dealing with very large sums of money, those are, um, you know, those are bonds are considered cash equivalents. Uh, and while I have Tremendous doubts about the U.S. government's ability to pay back a 30-year bond of the long term. Um, I don't have a whole lot of concerns over a four-week term, uh, which is, uh, you know, that's the shortest term duration. But for the most part, um, look, as, as interest rates go up, uh, bond prices are going to go down. So, we, you know, we certainly seem to have entered a, an environment where interest rates are coming up from their all-time lows. So anybody that's holding on to existing bonds, more than likely those bond prices are probably going to decline uh, as interest rates continue to increase. So if you hold the view that interest rates are going up, you probably don't want to own uh, certainly longer dated bonds. You don't want to own 10-year, 30-year uh, type bonds because those are going to lose value as interest rates go up. Are you bullish or bearish on the cannabis marijuana industry in the United States? Um, I own uh, cannabis shares uh, through my bank um, and that I'm, I'm very excited about. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, I think there's a lot of guys that are rushing into the cannabis space. I think there are a lot of a lot of guys that you know think they know how to grow weed and you know there's, you know, there's, there's a bunch of basically there's just a bunch of you know guys who love weed that are you know taking their company you know starting a company and taking it public. And it's becoming this big investment fad now. So investors are bidding up the prices of these cannabis companies, many of which don't even make any money to these absurd valuations. Um, so I'm I'm actually I'm quite cautious on that. But if you can actually find a real cannabis company that has a real business model, um, you know, that, that can actually make money, that has the you know the requisite uh, qualifications and the ability to, to to produce in a professional and scalable way. Um, absolutely, I'm you know I'm, I'm I'm quite bullish on that, and I think uh, I think those uh, I think like the dot com boom, most of those companies went bust, but a handful of them you know just went to the moon, and and I think like anything else, it's a question of finding the right ones. Simon Black, SovereignMan.com. How can people find your work and more details about what you do? Um, yeah, just the, the public website uh, where we write a free, uh, I write a free letter just about every day. So that's at SovereignMan.com and just kind of talk about where I'm going in the world, uh, where I'm traveling, what I'm doing and uh, what I'm seeing. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's available for free at SovereignMan.com. Perfect. Thank you very much, Simon Black. 
Okay. Enjoy the, the conversation. Thanks. I love Simon's story as it represents the process many free thinking uh, free thinkers go through. First, we want to contribute to our nation, for example, um, but, but then we learn that our nation's leaders are not out to help us, but they're corporate masters. I know that's what's happened, that's what happened to me personally, and, and Simon has just shared a similar story. I remember vividly how I read the book Creature of Jekyll Island about how the Federal Reserve Bank was created, and I was shocked by the way that they wanted to cheat the American people since inception, basically. 2008 was another major wake-up call where organizations and donors to crooked politicians got the best treatment and free taxpayers' money. JP Morgan's silver rigging court case was the latest example of this uh, above-the-law treatment certain banks and organizations receive. And, and you know, we've actually produced a special report and a micro documentary about um, JP Morgan's silver case at wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash silver rigging. And Simon Black, the sovereign man, talked about the need to diversify politically and know the second passport. And that's great advice. It's, it's an insurance policy, basically. And I'm finalizing my second citizenship myself as we speak. Next week, we will have important interviews on Bitcoin and what the current trends are pointing to um, and about the, uh, the, the ETF that, uh, that Bitcoin is, is now looking to create. Thanks for tuning in and we'll have great shows for you throughout the, March, the month of March as the debt ceiling approaches.